Hey, Sun Devils, it's Mr. Moore. I'm here with you on week 25 of AP European History. And this week, we're going to be talking about the Russian Revolution. It is one of the biggest events to happen in the 20th century. And interestingly enough, it is a part of World War I. It is both caused by and drawn out because of World War I. Right in the midst of the biggest war in the history of humankind, to that point, Russia falls apart, literally falls apart at the seams. And one of the oldest and most powerful and biggest countries in the world is going to crumble. And it's going to go through an incredibly huge social shift. The Russian Revolution is catastrophic and monumental. And we are still living in the wake of these events. We're just a little over 100 years uh, since the Russian Revolution. In fact, the Russian Civil War is just about 100 years old right now. I'm recording this in 2021. And uh, they were just wrapping up their whole civil war because of this Russian Revolution. So it's just a uh, 100 years old, this, this event. And I think it's as monumental as the French Revolution. It affects everything in the world and causes a paradigm shift to happen for the next hundred years, which again, we're living in that wake. So how does World War I and social unrest in Russia affect world history? Well, let's dive straight into it. As a student in my class, I expect you to know your geography. And in this class, I have tested you on the map of Europe, okay? All the countries of Europe. I have tested you on the countries of North and South America. I have tested you on the countries of Africa. And in a few weeks, I'm going to test you on the countries of Asia. So we'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, one of the biggest countries on the planet Earth is Russia. Today, it is the world's biggest. Um, of course, when this class first started, um, it wasn't nearly as big as it is today. But over time, it grew in size. And in fact, in a lot of points in this class, it was even bigger than it is today. Uh, so today on the planet Earth, Russia is the single biggest landmass. It is about one-third in Europe and about two-thirds in Asia. However, the vast majority of the people that live in Russia live in the European part of the country. And so it does seem like a European country. Uh, even though two-thirds of it are in Asia. Um, it does not have the world's biggest population. In fact, if you go Google the population of Bangladesh, this little country right here, and you Google the population of Russia, you might be shocked to see which one has a bigger population. So it doesn't have the world's biggest population, but it does have the world's biggest nuclear arsenal. Um, Russia won. World War II, and Russia was on the winning side of World War I until it dropped out. So it's a key player in world politics, and that's what we're going to be doing this week, is studying everything Russia. Let's talk about some of the long-term problems in Russia. Mother Russia, Mother Russia, was huge and politically backwards. So the fact that it's it covers so much territory means that, that there are some parts of Russia that just don't see the modern era until decades after the rest of the world. Maybe even some parts that didn't see modern technology until centuries after the rest of Russia was getting it. Russia is always behind the rest of Europe. And if you remember, there was uh, you know Peter the Great, and then followed by Catherine the Great, who were monarchs, czars in Russia, who tried to modernize Russia, get it up to speed with the rest of Europe. We're talking, you know, 1700s, you know, maybe early 1800s when Peter the Great and Catherine the Great are around, okay? Um, so by the time that the Industrial Revolution is modernizing Great Britain and then northern parts of Europe, like Germany, what's going to become Germany and parts of France, uh, this and, you know, of course, like the low countries, like the Dutch areas, industrialization sweeps the northern part of Europe, but when it comes to Eastern Europe, the Industrial Revolution just doesn't quite get there. So the Industrial Revolution was late coming to Russia, and serfdom, 
lasted longer in Russia than other places. So Russia was like socially backwards when the rest of Europe was like trying to get equality for people. And, you know, women were pushing for, you know, the right to vote in, in Western Europe. Russia was still having like peasants and serfs. And so it was backwards. It felt backwards. It was kind of the fringe of Europe. And so Russia's kind of, it takes a little longer for things to get done there. Um, in early in the early 1800s, there were some major troubles in Russia. Uh, there was like some military leaders who revolted against the Tsar. Now they weren't successful in like totally radically changing Russia, but it did show that there was some discontent. It happened in uh, their month of December. Hence, they call it the Decemberist Revolt. Um, and, and again, it wasn't long lasting and catastrophic for Russia, but it does show that there's some discontent. Um, before World War I, there were problems in Russia between the social classes. Um, there was a czar, Alexander II, who was assassinated in 1881. So again, in the 1800s, we can feel that there's some tension mounting. Nothing happens just overnight. There's always long-term problems that cause what we're going to be talking about today. The Russian revolution happens during world war one. So we're talking 1917, right? Uh, in the, in the middle of world war one. So what I'm doing right now, of course, is just kind of laying some important backdrop. It's a technique and a skill in a history class that we would call uh, contextualization or adding context. So what I'm doing is trying to give you just the essential background information that you need to understand to understand why there's a revolution in Russia. So in the late 1800s, one of the, the leaders of Russia, the czar, and remember the word czar is really like a, a Russian word for Caesar, right? Caesar. Uh, and so this is the emperor of Russia who's assassinated because of political discontent in the country. Now, here's the next thing that I think is a major blow to Russia. The failure of Russia to win the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 1905 embarrassed the Russians and weakened the power of the Tsar and revolts spread across parts of Russia. Notice I spelled the word czar differently because these are two different ways that you might see those words. Um, remember that in Russian, they would spell it completely different. They use a, com a completely different alphabet. So that's just us trying to Anglify or Englishize a Russian word. So what was happening is China had been, been diced apart in the 1800s. Remember the Opium Wars and the British and the French and even the Americans were getting involved in dicing apart Asia. Russia also wanted to get its hand in, in, the, in the China pie. And so they were trying to uh, build a railroad across the continent. And they were trying to get access to ports here, right next to the uh, Korean Peninsula. There's a, a port called Port Arthur. And so this piece of China, Manchuria, was heavily contested uh, by different European powers. And actually the Japanese, if you remember, we had talked about the Japanese not wanting to be taken over like the rest of Asia. So they resisted European imperialism and started to imperialize themselves. They actually started to imperialize the uh, Korean Peninsula. And they wanted access to this part of China as well. Okay, because this was their sphere of influence. And so the Russians and the Japanese are going to come into conflict over who controls this northern part of China. And that's going to lead to the Russo-Japanese War. Now, like I said, almost all the Russians live over here in the European part. And there's, there's just some port cities. And it is Russian territory. Remember that Russia even controlled Alaska during the 1800s. And they just barely sold Alaska to the United States. So they even owned a part of North America. We bought Alaska from Russia. So the Japanese were heavily interested in getting involved in this area here. And so they go to war with Russia. And here's the key. Little tiny Japan beats gigantic Russia. Japan had been working to modernize their military and navy. And the Russians were still kind of lagging behind technologically. And of course, it was on the other side of the world. And the Japanese soundly defeated 
the Russians. And this was the first time, this is the first time that um, a non-European country had bested a European power. And so the Russians were humiliated. And there were revolts and problems in Russia, and people started discrediting the czar. And they started having political, you know, camp just fighting and, and discord. I'm just trying to think of the right word to describe the chaos and the dissatisfaction that people had because of what was happening after this Russo-Japanese war. And you can see the dates. It's right before World War I. Um, there was a group of workers in Russia that the Russians called the proletariat. That's a key word you're going to want to highlight in your notes. The proletariat is the working class of Russia. And they wanted to fix the problems that had been growing over the last century or more. And as the rest of, of Europe had been liberalizing and having more freedom of speech and even some open elections, Russia was backwards and behind the times technologically. And so a lot of these proletariat wanted a better life. And so all of these problems are going to be amplified or exacerbated because of World War I. The last czar of Russia was Nicholas II, and he is going to give up the throne right in the middle of World War I. And right shortly after he abdicates the throne, he's going to be shot and killed. His entire family is going to be killed, except for maybe one of his daughters, Anastasia, there's some debate on that, and most historians will say it's just a legend, um, but there are some people who hang on to those little conspiracy theories that maybe one of the daughters of the Tsar, one of the daughters of Nicholas II, wasn't shot and killed during the revolution, her name being Anastasia. So maybe you've heard that story before. Um, there has been some serious problems in Russia during the 1800s. One of those was a pogrom, is a violent policy aimed at Jewish people, anti-Semitism, right? The persecution and targeting of an ethnic or religious group. So sometimes people would talk about the pogroms. I don't know if you've ever heard the story of Fiddler on the Roof. When I was growing up, that was a popular musical. And uh, Fiddler on the Roof takes place, kind of follows a Jewish family living in Russia and how there's a growing hatred towards Jewish people. Now, if you think that this was just a problem that happened in Nazi Germany, then you, you are sorely misinformed, right? This Russian term is used to describe the 19th and 20th century targeting uh, of Jews or discrimination against Jews. Uh, that word is anti-Semitism, okay? Um, so anyways, again, Fiddler on the Roof, if, if you're familiar with that story, that's kind of what we're talking about. Just to get to know Russia just a little bit, the capital, the modern day capital of Russia is Moscow. Okay. Back in the, uh, 1800s, the capital was St. Petersburg. Okay. But, um, after the revolution, Moscow is going to reclaim its title as the capital of the Russian empire. And um, this is the central part of downtown Moscow. It's called Red Square. And this building over here you can kind of see is called the Kremlin. And uh, these are words that people use in spy novels during the Cold War or people talk about, um, you know, during World War II uh, when Stalin was running the program. Uh, but you can see this iconic Russian Orthodox Church um, right downtown and along with the Kremlin. And that's the heart of of Moscow, the capital of modern Russia. So we're going to take us from old school imperial Russia into what we call the Soviet Union. And this is going to be a transition from an imperialistic uh, you know, government to a communist government. And communism is based on the writings of Karl Marx. So when we talk about the Russian Revolution, we need to understand communism because it's at the heart of the Russian Revolution. Karl Marx was a German writer, and he was living right in the midst of the Industrial Revolution. And he saw a serious problem with capitalism because he saw capitalists making all the money while the regular workers did all the work. So the, the, the people who were actually doing all the work were getting nothing. And the people who were, um, who were born into money and could finance industry, 
they were the ones who were getting like sickly rich on things. So Karl Marx and his buddy Frederick Engels uh, are seen as the father of communism. And they wrote together the Communist Manifesto. When people talk about communism, they sometimes call it Marxism. Okay. They felt like the workers were not going to put up with it. They felt like the workers were going to rise up and take over the government and give everyone a, a, an equal slice of the pie. Communism, of course, comes from that word of community, right? Everybody working together for the common good. See the word communism, common good, the collective, right? And everybody getting an equal slice of the pie so that nobody gets left out. There's not going to be rich and poor. Everybody gets a slice of the pie. And a lot of people really liked this idea. Some people still like this idea. There are, of course, problems with communism, but you can see the appeal of it, right? People buy into that. So communism is the opposite of capitalism. Um, people on the right side of the political spectrum, the further right you go, it seems to be you're more okay with there being rich and poor because the right mentality kind of says that those who are rich deserve to be rich because they work harder, they're more industrious, uh, they're smarter, they're in, they, they take more risks. On the left, people tend to believe more in equality, like everybody should get that equal slice of the pie, like everybody, there shouldn't be so much rich and poor, we should, you know, rob from the rich to feed the poor, kind of more of an idea. Um, so communism definitely falls on the far left of the political spectrum, and that's something that we've talked about before in class. So I'm assuming you already know or you remember our discussion on the political spectrum. But communist ideas are very much on the left. And there are some people who put socialism and communism in the same category or say that they're the same thing. And then there are some people who kind of separate it and say socialism is maybe on its way to becoming communism, but communism is that way out there in left field. Communism in Russia turned into a political and economic system that is based on the state redistributing wealth and controlling the means of production. To Karl Marx, everything is about class struggle. In fact, Karl Marx, to a certain extent, did some history himself. And when he did history, he would, he would kind of paint everything in history on these terms of class struggle. Everything is a class struggle. It's the haves and the have-nots. And whoever controls the means of production controls society. Now, originally, communism was meant uh, to destroy government, and there wasn't going to be a government. There's no need to have a government if everybody gets an equal slice of the pie. It was going to be a worker's paradise. I've got my air quotes going on here. Uh, it turns out, though, <clears throat> in reality, the theoretical communism is put into practice in a different way than it is on paper, and it's going to become a very obtrusive government that's going to really push away people's rights. Marxist ideas in theory then are different than how they're actually put into practice in Russia. That's what I'm trying to say. So communist ideas on paper, like in the Communist Manifesto, or when Karl Marx wrote his Das Kapital, right, another writing where he kind of slams capitalism and saying how it's all greed and you know, those who have are going to continue to have and give it to their kids. And there's always going to be people left out. Um, when he writes this, um, this theory, it's going to be put into practice differently. This, the state's going to actually end up controlling everything, which is not what Karl Marx originally wrote about. Again, as I just said out loud, some people will say communism and socialism are the same thing. Socialism is the idea that society is more important than the individual. So what's best for the greater good. Okay. That's kind of the idea of socialism. Um, so if we take from those that have to give to those that don't have, if people voluntarily do that, that's charity, right? If I have a ton of money and then I, I, I set up a foundation to help poor kids or to set up a, you know, a shelter for homeless people, that's me making that choice. The problem with communism is, the government steps in and starts to force you to give up a certain amount of, of money so that they can redistribute the wealth. And that's really what gets under some people's skin. Communism, B, 
became a political party in many countries around the world in the 20th century. So communism is born in the 1800s, but by the 1900s, we're seeing communist parties around the globe. There was a communist party. There is a communist party of the United States. There are people in the United States who are communist. Um, during the Cold War, that was a bad word. Nobody would want to fess up to being a communist. Um, but things change politically and ideologically over time. There was even what they sometimes call a red scare. Again, I got my air quotes going on here. In the United States, uh, around this time of the Russian Revolution, there's going to be a red scare in the United States. People feel like there's going to be a communist revolution here. And then after World War II, there's going to be another communist scare, a red scare. And people in Hollywood are going to be blacklisted because people are saying they're communist. Um, there's going to be McCarthyism, this senator who was accusing people of being communist and they'd lose their job and their reputation. It's, it's a significant part of American history, this whole idea of communism. If there is one thing that Hitler hated, it was communism. When Hitler's going to take power, I'll talk about this next week. When Hitler takes power, he bans the communist party. He hated communists. He purposely targeted and killed millions of communists. Um, he kind of put Jews and communists into the same category, uh, but it's interesting how much he hated communism. Uh, so World War II is really going to become an ideological battle between fascists like Hitler and communists like Stalin. It really is going to become a political spectrum battle. Uh, communists are almost always atheists. And communist countries are very anti-religious. Um, Karl Marx grew up in a Europe where he saw, and he read about, of course, just like you have in this class, some of the religious conflict. He saw the Catholic Church as having so much influence on society and in some ways being hypocritical. And he saw the, the fighting between Protestants and Catholics within Christianity. And he thought that um, with the new science that was coming out, he kind of thought that people just used religion or religion was used to try to, you know, keep people in line or it was used to kind of make people feel better, but there really wasn't a God. And so Marx famously said that religion is the opium of the masses. At least that's a quote that he's attributed to saying. Um, so most communist countries are very anti-religious. So a lot of Christians are very anti-communist because communism is anti-religion, right? And so most people who are, you know, deeply religious do not like communism because of that anti-religious part. Um, so here's a little, um, you know, video if you want to check it out, communism, good or bad, just some thought provoking things. And some people get very stirred up on this. Um, but I think it's, it's great information uh, to kind of, you know, hopefully bring about some dialogue. These are probably the five most famous communists of time. If you want to take out your, uh, your notes and write this down, this is Karl Marx. He's the father of communism, but he was never like the leader of a country. He was more of a thinker, a philosopher. Okay. This guy right here is going to be um, the hero or the villain of the Russian Revolution, depending on your side. This right here is Vladimir Lenin. He is the guy who starts the Russian Revolution, or at least the communist Russian Revolution. There's multiple stages we'll talk about. This is maybe the most famous um, communist of all time, and probably one of the biggest jerks in the history of the world. There's nothing good to say about Stalin. He is a horrible person, and he killed millions and millions, maybe more people than Hitler. Okay, this is Joseph Stalin. He is going to be on our team in World War II. So because we are fighting against Hitler, we always see him as the only bad guy. But Hitler was a bad guy, as bad as they get. But Stalin was just as bad. He was a murderer. He was vicious. If there was an award for, like, worst father of the year, it would have to go to Stalin. I mean, if it's just a quick story. Um, there's a story about Stalin's kid the son of Stalin, who was captured by the Nazis in uh, World War II. And Hitler and the Nazis felt like they could use that as leverage, right? Like, hey, we got your son. Stalin didn't care. In fact, Stalin, one of Stalin's sons tried to commit suicide 
you know, kill himself by suicide. And um, he didn't succeed. And what did Stalin say about that? He said, you're not even good enough to kill yourself. Like, that's how bad of a father Stalin was. Horrific person. Um, this guy right here is famous for Americans um, because he set up a communist country just off the coast of Florida, Cuba. This is Fidel Castro. And the United States has had problems with Fidel Castro and, and communists in Cuba for decades. In fact, we don't even have regular relationships with the country of Cuba because it's a communist country to this very day. And it's still Castro's family that's leading Cuba to this very day. This guy right here, you might not recognize, but he is probably the biggest mass murderer in the history of the world. He makes even Stalin and Hitler figures look smaller. Uh, this guy right here is probably responsible for more people's deaths than any other human being. That is debatable. Maybe Genghis Khan or, you know, Alexander the Great. Or, it's tough to know some of these ancient uh, or medieval figures. But in the modern world, Mao Zedong. However, if you go to China today, which China, the world's biggest population, is still a communist country, Mao Zedong is their hero. So is Mao Zedong a hero or a villain? Well, that's the debate, right? So let's talk about Lenin. Vladimir Lenin the leader of the communist revolution in Russia. Here's a new word we're going to learn, Bolshevik. In Russia, the communists called themselves the Bolsheviks. So when we say Bolshevik, we mean communist. When I say Marxist, I mean communist. Some people, when they say socialist, they mean communist. If you still don't understand what a communist is, we got to get there in this lecture. So Vladimir Lenin is the leader of the Bolsheviks, the communist revolution in Russia. The Russian army was falling apart during World War I. Soldiers deserted the front. They just left their positions. They're like, how can we fight the Germans? We don't even have enough munitions. And our leaders are idiots. And our families are starving back at home. And Russia is falling apart. So they left. And if you leave the military... Without proper authorization, that's mutiny, right? So soldiers were deserting, <clears throat> and there was widespread mutiny going against their leaders, and the army was falling apart. Communists in Russia see World War I as an opportunity to push for revolution, and the Germans encouraged this turmoil. In fact, there was a secret German plot. When they saw the problems going on in Russia... <laughs> They actually went to Vladimir Lenin, who was kicked out of Russia. Before World War I, Lenin was kicked out of Russia for causing trouble. And he was actually living in a neutral country called Switzerland. And so the Germans go to Lenin and they say, hey, man, there's trouble in Russia. We know that you want to get in back. We know you want to get back to Russia. So we're going to help you get into Russia. And we want you to stir up problems. And in fact, we're going to give you money and supplies. So it's kind of like. Lenin became German's secret weapon to go back to Russia and start a fire. And of course, I'm talking symbolic, but literally, right? Cause trouble, stir up problems. The one problem you have to keep in mind, though, if you, if you hate your neighbor, like Germany hates Russia, they're in the middle of a war. If you set your neighbor's house on fire... Well, there's a chance that you might start a fire, that, that fire might spread to your own house. I don't know if that makes sense. So the Germans are going to take a gamble here. They're going to start a communist rev revolution in Russia by funding Vladimir Lenin. The problem is if, if that R Russian communist revolution spreads outside of Russia and, and it could backfire, it could burn down Germany. And that's what Hitler was so scared of. He saw the communist revolution in Russia spilling over into Germany. And he said, we, we, we might have burned our own house down. So again, Vladimir Lenin is a Russian. He got kicked out of Russia. He was living in Switzerland. And the Germans helped get him back into Russia because the Russians and the Germans are fighting. And they want Russia to burn. So as I just said, Lenin was kicked out of Russia before World War, World War I. But he returns and the revolution breaks out in 1917. Lenin called on the Russian monarch, Nicholas II, to enforce social change and reform the Duma. Uh, the Duma is kind of like a parliament in, in, in Russia. So when you hear the word Duma, 
think of like parliament. Um, and the czar being an absolute monarch, and we're talking, see, when we studied absolute monarchs like Louis the 14th, we were talking 1600s and 1700s. But we're talking this Nicholas II is like an absolute monarch in the year, you know, 1914. So they're they're calling and saying, hey, let's get with the times. Let's form a Duma. And of course, when change doesn't happen, the proletariat, the working class, protested in the city of Petrograd. Now, here's where it gets slightly tricky. There's a city called St. Petersburg. That city was uh, created by um, Peter the Great. We're talking back in like the, you know, 16, 1700s, Peter the Great. Okay. And of course, Catherine the Great lived there in St. Petersburg and the, the, the Russian czars had been living there in St. Petersburg. But during World War I, St. Petersburg sounded too German. And so the people started calling St. Petersburg Petrograd. After the revolution, they're going to call it Leningrad. So that's the same city with three names. Today, if you go to Russia, um, it will probably be called St. Petersburg. But there are still some writings and, and you know, literature you'll read about Leningrad. So hope that's not too confusing. Um, these are some shots of fighting in the streets of Petrograd, a.k.a. St. Petersburg. This is a picture of Lenin, you know, talking to the people, giving his battle cry, bread, land, and peace. And, uh, of course, soldiers who are defecting or deserting or mutiny, right, leaving the army during World War I. And this guy right here in the corner is probably the craziest, wildest figure from the Russian Revolution. He's a wild card. His name is Rasputin. And the legends and stories about Rasputin are legendary. Um, this guy right here was, uh, theoretically, he was a Russian Orthodox monk. So he's supposed to be a holy man. People claimed he had magic powers. Um, the czar, Nicholas II, would hire him to kill his son. Nicholas II had a son who was a hemophiliac. I don't know if you know what that is, but um, people who uh, get cuts and their blood won't clot, so they, they can't heal themselves. It's called hemophilia. Um, so, you know, most of us, if I get punched really hard, I get a bruise and a bruise is bleeding under the skin, right? But it stops. Well, a hemophiliac, their blood won't clot. And so it will continue to cause serious problems and issues. And, and, uh, or if you get a little cut, you, you can't stop bleeding, but miraculously, um, his son, Nicholas, the second son was cured multiple times by this crazy guy, Rasputin. And, uh, during world war one, the czar, Nicholas II, went out to the front lines to try to, you know, motivate the troops. And he left his wife, the Tsarina, right, the, the, the empress of Russia in charge. And Rasputin was good friends with her. I say good friends in air quotes. We don't, I don't know. He, he was a wild card, man. But um, he, he had a lot of influence over the empress of Russia. And so many other Russians were, like, nervous about this guy that they tried to have him assassinated. And I've read the story lots of different ways, so I'm not even sure which one's the true story. But they're all so awesome. i got to tell at least a little bit of it. Um, apparently, they invite uh, Rasputin over for, for dinner. And uh, they give him biscuits with rat poison in it. And he eats the biscuits and he doesn't die. And then they give him wine with like cyanide or poison in it. He drinks it and he doesn't die. So they invite him down into the to the lower room. Uh, they say they want to talk to him privately. And then they beat him with clubs until he's dead. Or at least they think he's dead. And they stash his body in a closet. And they're like, we tried to poison him and he didn't die. We tried to beat him to death. They go down uh, later that night as the story goes to go like bury his body. And he's not dead. He comes out fighting. So they shoot him. According to some stories, they shoot him multiple times and he still doesn't die. Then they dump his body in a frozen river. And there are some people who say um, that they, they saw tracks leading out of the river and then he never died. Anyways, we don't even know what the whole real story is. But this guy is a wild card, Rasputin. All right. So let's get into this. There are several stages of the Russian Revolution. We are right in the middle of World War I. There's chaos in Russia because so many resources are being spent on the war. So in they call this the February Revolution. 
because in March of 1917, Tsar Nicholas II is removed from power, ending the Romanov dynasty. So if you think about the story of Anastasia or the death of Rasputin that I just kind of told you, then you kind of know what I'm talking about, that story. Um, funny enough, we just watched the little cartoon uh, video on Disney Plus, Anastasia. And of course, it's a cartoon, but it, it kind of does follow that legendary story. And Rasputin is a key figure in there. They show him as this magician, but people really did think he had magic powers. Now, you might have caught this and you said, Mr. Moore, you said the February Revolution, but then you said it took place in March. That sounds stupid. Uh, Russians were using the Julian calendar instead of the uh, Gregorian calendar that we use here. And so the months are slightly off. I know that sounds weird. Um, in modern day, they used the Gregorian calendar, but back then they were still using the old school Julian calendar. I know, dates are kind of weird and random things. After this initial revolution, and by the way, if I could just say this, the February revolution is not led by communists. It's just led by the proletariat. It's, it's led by soldiers who are pissed off. It's led by workers who were disgruntled. But it is not the Russian revolution. It's not the communist revolution. So they set up what they call a temporary government. They call it the provisional government. It's a temporary intermediate government established to run the affairs of Russia by a guy named Alexander Kerensky. And this government kept Russia in World War I. That's probably what, what failed here. If the provisional government had pulled out of World War I, that's what people were so angry about. They're like, we're dying by the millions and people back home are starving because all of our resources are going to fight Germany and we don't really care. Why are we fighting Germany? The only reason we're fighting Germany is because we signed an agreement with France. And the only reason we're, we're doing that is because the, the Austrians invaded Serbia. Oh, this is complicated. Remember, that's what kind of causes World War I. So Alexander Kerensky uh, took over after the, the death of Nicholas II, and he tried to run Russia with this temporary government. Uh, but unfortunately, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick in World War I, and we're going to stick this out and win. Um, but people continued to be frustrated. So later in that same year is what we call the October Revolution. Again, it takes place in November on our calendar, but Russians refer to this as the October Revolution. And this is the second phase. The provisional government is overthrown by communists. Uh, and Lenin and his Bolsheviks, their battle cry is bread, land, and peace. Remember the battle cry uh, of the French Revolution? Liberty, equality, and fraternity. Um, but this is this is utterly different. Look how practical this is. You guys are starving to death. We'll get you bread. Uh, the government is, you know, uh, the, the 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 rich people have taken all the land. All the nobles have taken the land. We'll get you land. Regular people will get you land. And peace. We're in the middle of the worst war in the in the history of the world, and we're taking the brunt of it. We're going to end this war. We're going to declare peace with Germany right away. So bread, land, and peace. That's very practical compared to, like, say, um, the, the battle cry of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Those were enlightenment ideas. This is like, hey, I'm starving. I need bread on my table. So there's definitely a practical side to this. The groups fighting for power during the communist revolution, there, there was multiple groups. The Bolsheviks are the majority, and they're the communists. And then there's the Mensheviks. Um, they're going to be the minority. And you probably never even heard of the Mensheviks, which means they're the losers. The Bolsheviks are going to come out on top, and Russia is going to become a communist state. Once Lenin is pow in power, Russia leaves World War I. So right in the middle of the war, one of the key players pulls out. And it could have been fatal for the Allies. I mean, this could have been the winning piece for Germany. But remember, 1917 is a key year for Americans. This is the year we enter the war. So at the same year that the Russians leave World War I, we enter. And so it kind of keeps uh, things balanced out in the war. So Russians leave and make a separate treaty with Germany, the brest uh Treaty. Okay, and I'm not very good with my Russian, but you get the idea. Um, the Red Army. Um, red becomes the symbolic color of communism. 
So earlier in this lecture, I, I used the word red scare. And that was a scare of, um, you know, communism in the United States during this Russian revolution, you know. Um, but uh, the, the army that is the Bolsheviks, the communist army in the Russian revolution, they call themselves the Red Army. And honestly, they're going to be the ones who win World War II. Okay. The word Soviets is a workers' council. And so Soviets are going to start to run the country. And if you've heard the word Soviets, you know that that's a word, another word that's associated with communism. So Marxism, Bolshevik, Soviets, um, you know, socialist, those are all words that almost mean the same thing. I mean, they they have different derivatives, um, but they're kind of used symbolically. So by the time Russia is done with a civil war at the end of this communist revolution, uh, Russia is going to stop calling itself Russia and it's going to call itself the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics. For short, people call it the Soviet Union. Um, the, the letters in English are USSR, okay? In Russian, it's actually CCCP. Um, so if you actually see like uh, any kind of old um, Soviet era uniforms, they would actually have four letters, CCCP. And in Russian, that's how you would say Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics. As Americans, we put USSR. When I was growing up, it was like the U.S. versus the USSR. That was the Cold War. And so that's what Russia was um, from this time, middle of World War I, uh, or just after, you know, when the Civil War was done, um, all the way until I was in high school in the 1990s when the Soviet Union fell apart. So um, later on, we're going to talk about the Cold War. And of course, the Cold War starts right after World War II, all the way up until I'm in high school. We thought that there was going to be World War III. We, we thought that um, we we're going to nuclearly annihilate each other, uh, the U.S. versus the USSR. Um, remember, I've actually kind of uh, pasted in here. Um, the, the, the words in Russian, you can see they use a different alphabet than we do. And so this is how we would write this in English, the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics, or the USSR. Um, but in Russian, that's how you would write it out. And so that's why they use the CCCP. Um, after Lenin. So the Russian Revolution leads to a civil war. So it's not just like some fighting in the streets. It's going to be full-on armies duking it out. The Mensheviks, the Bolsheviks, the Red Army versus the White Army. And it's going to go on past the end of World War I. You know, I said that World War I ends on the 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. That's kind of true. If you were living in Russia, that wasn't true. World War I ended in 1917, and it just started for the United States in 1917. But in 1918, when everybody calls a timeout with that armistice, Russia doesn't. They are fighting themselves. And there's death and destruction. So the World War I allies back the White Army to help keep Russia in the war. Remember, the United States is entering World War I in 1917, just as Russia is leaving. And so the United States is very determined to keep Russia in the war. I and mean, that, that, that will help us out. If Russia pulls out, that means more deaths on our shoulders. And so we really wanted the White Army to keep Russia in the war. But the Red Army, led by the Bolsheviks and yeah. Lenin, were pulling Russia out of the war. So Lenin was the first communist leader of Russia. But he died right after the Civil War was done. So he doesn't last very long. He's very symbolic and significant in the Russian Revolution. But he dies right afterwards, resulting in a power struggle. And the person who takes his place is Joseph Stalin, the man of steel. He takes over the USSR after exiling and then killing his rival, Leon Trotsky. If there is one thing that's pretty clear, it's clear that Lenin did not like Stalin. He liked having Stalin during the revolution. See, if you're going to fight a revolution, you need to kill people. And if you're going to kill people, you need somebody who's good at killing. And that's Stalin. Stalin's great. He's a blunt instrument. He's the guy that you can get out uh, to take care of business. And he doesn't have a conscience. And, well, he'll get stuff done. 
but Lenin didn't want Stalin taking over. You know, he was kind of scared of what that guy was capable of. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that Lenin would have much preferred Leon Trotsky to take over. But Stalin being the ruthless, conniving guy that he was, he ends up killing off all his political rivals. And Leon Trotsky has to escape the country. Leon Trotsky has to bail and he leaves Russia. And ironically, Leon Trotsky ends up living in Mexico, right? Our neighbor to the south. And Stalin has him assassinated in Mexico. He's killed with an ice pick. Uh, so, I mean, imagine a hitman doing the job with an ice pick. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about in Stalin. So Trotsky ends up dying in Mexico because he has to escape. Stalin was a ruthless leader. And I, like I said, killed more of his own people than Hitler did in the Holocaust. Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to make Hitler seem like a good guy. He's, he's, he's got to be in the top five worst people ever in the history of the world. My concern is that sometimes we forget about these other bad guys, right? These other guys who are horrific. And Stalin is one of them. Uh, so why does Hitler get the biggest bad guy in history award rather than people like Stalin? For one thing, Stalin was on our side in World War II. We're going to join teams with Stalin because we hated Hitler so much. So if you're fighting with somebody, you tend to try to make people think he's a good guy, even though he wasn't, right? And second, we didn't have all the information. Remember, um, information in the Soviet Union, remember CCCP is the USSR, right? Uh, the Soviet Union, it was not well known during the Cold War years. So it wasn't until after World War II where maybe we really understood how bad things really were. Remember, we didn't even know how bad Hitler was until those death camps were discovered at the end of World War II. When George Patton was driving his tanks through, you know, German occupied areas and the Russians, they actually did a lot of the liberating of these uh, concentration camps. We didn't know how bad it was in Germany until after the war. So we didn't even know how bad it was in the Soviet Union fully until, you know, years after so maybe that's why um, Stalin maybe isn't painted as such a bad guy. I had to put a little ice pick just to remind you how Trotsky died. So let me just review real quick. The Russian Revolution. If we start in the 1900s, Tsar Nicholas II rules over the Russian Empire with absolute power. There were problems in the 1800s that we talked about. Okay. Um, you know, the Decemberist revolt and Alexander the czar being assassinated. But by the time the 1900s hit, Nicholas II is in power. In 1904, Russia suffered a humiliating defeat in a war against Japan, which leads to protests and a call for reform. The Russians lost the Russo-Japanese War. And in 1905, there's some bloody fighting. Uh, Nicholas II agrees to allow a Duma or a legislative branch so that the people can have a say. He forms the Duma, but he doesn't allow them any kind of real power. And so it doesn't solve the problem. In fact, in some ways, it just pisses the people off even more. In 1914, Russia enters World War I and quickly suffered heavy losses in major defeats to Germany along the Eastern Front. By 1917, remember, this is the February Revolution that's really in March. Um, the 1917 revolts in Petrograd forced the Tsar to abdicate and a provisional republic was established. Remember, they instigate. Um, this is not the Russian Revolution yet in March. Well, February Revolution. It's not yet the, the, the Communist Revolution. It's part of the Russian Revolution, but it's not the Communist yet. That's going to take place what they call the October Revolution in November. Uh, Lenin and his Bolsheviks take control in Petrograd, a.k.a. St. Petersburg, and overthrow the provisional government. Um, the Bolshevik Red Army fight and win a civil war against the White Army. So this goes on for several years, even after World War I is done. And in 1922, when the, the Civil War is done, uh, Lenin establishes the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics under the control of the Communist Party. And it takes a few years. And Stalin, you know, has to, you know, play a, a, a game of life and death chess, right, where he's outmaneuvering his political enemies. But by 1929, Stalin becomes the sole 
ruler of the Soviet Union and created a totalitarian state. So what was it like in, in the Soviet Union under Stalin? Because of the economic problems with communism, Lenin did allow some capitalist ideas into the Soviet Union. He called it the new economic plan. Remember that communism is supposed to make everybody get an equal slice of the pie. But that also means if everybody gets an equal slice of the pie, then there's not a lot of motivation to work super hard. See, one of the things about capitalism is if I work hard and I'm smart and I take risks, I can get rich. But in a communist system, that, that doesn't, it's not there, right? There's, there's no motivation there. So Lenin did realize that people did need some motivation. And so he did allow um, some capitalistic ideas to try to promote and encourage people to be more economically sound. Uh, Stalin, after Lenin dies, Stalin attempts to catch the Soviet Union up to the rest of Europe. And he says, hey, look, the rest of Europe is ahead of us technologically. And that's why we were getting our butts kicked in World War I. And that's why our production is so low and people are starving to death. So he implements what he calls these five-year plans. He says in five years, we're going to meet these quotas and we're going to industrialize. And I, I don't care if people die in the process, we're going to catch up to the rest of Europe and we're going to be an economic powerhouse. And so these five-year plans are implemented. Ironically, the Soviet Union begins to move forward economically during the interwar years, while the capitalist economies in Europe struggled. So we're going to talk about this next week, but in between World War I and World War II, the capitalist countries of the world are going to crash economically. It's called the Great Depression. It's the worst economic times the world has ever seen. So as these capitalist countries are, are they're going to hit rock bottom, the Soviet Union is going to be slowly climbing up and people are going to look at the Soviet Union and say, wow, maybe communism is a viable option. Maybe it's better than capitalism. Look, the proof is right there. The rest of the world is dying economically and Russia is improving. Um, one of the other things that um, Stalin is, is famous for is called collectivization. Uh, Stalin's government policy to take land from the kulaks, that's the Russian farmers, and create large industrial farms to feed the people of the Soviet Union. Now, I don't know if you're catching how ironic this is, but I'm going to try to point out this ir irony here in a minute, because if you remember Lenin's battle cry, what I'm saying right now is going to become tragically ironic. So there's something called the Great Famine. It actually has its own name, like... There's a genocide in World War II that's so famous it has its own name, the Holocaust. This is a famine that takes place in Ukraine in between World War I and World War II. And so many people died that it has its own name, the Holodomor. And millions of Ukrainians died due to Stalin's man-made famine and poor central planning of collective farms. If you read the numbers of how many people died in Ukraine on these forced famines as they were trying to collectivize farming in the Soviet Union, the numbers get up as big or bigger than the number of people killed in the Holocaust. It's staggering. Add on top of that that uh, Stalin was uh, – he was scared uh, of people betraying him probably because he betrayed a lot of people. He was scared of assassination, probably because he assassinated a lot of people. And so he feels like there's some people who are like um, not getting in line or maybe plotting against him. And so he purges his military. Ironically, he purges his military, if you look at the dates right here, right before World War II. This is going to set Russia back or the Soviet Union back in World War II. Millions are exiled to gulags. Those are Siberian death camps. In fact, some people say that Stalin invented the concentration camp and Hitler just used Stalin's ideas to, you know, to capture Jewish people and, and exterminate them. But Stalin was doing this before Hitler even. Uh, so he executed enemies of the states and he sent some of them out to work camps in Siberia, which is like the middle of nowhere, Russia, uh, in these work camps or these death camps that were called gulags. Um, here's the part. Notice the irony of Vladimir Lenin's message of bread, land, and peace to what 
uh, Stalin did in the Soviet Union when he took over. You know, Lenin was promising people bread. You're starving to death. I'm going to help you. Really? Look what Stalin did. This huge famine. Okay. He said, we're going to give you land, right? Oh, they're taking land away from the people in collectivization. Lenin said, I'm going to give you peace. This does not peace. In fact, Russia is going to take the brunt of World War II. Um, so it's ironic. That's the irony. It's tragic. Um, but what Lenin promised and what Stalin delivered are night and day differences. This is famous. If you've ever learned anything about Russia, you've probably heard of the gulags, these Soviet labor camps. Um, th this kind of ends it where we are. If you have time to watch this video, it takes you from the czars of imperial Russia up to the modern. Some people say modern czar, uh, like Vladimir um, Vladimir Putin is the current leader of Russia, and he took over after the Cold War. There was Boris Yeltsin in between there, but really, um, uh, Putin has been the leader of Russia for several decades. Um, hopefully, that kind of gives you a crash course in uh, the Russian Revolution. I got some great videos that I hope you'll check out. Um, you know, all kinds of videos to try to help you understand what we're learning about this week. This is week 25, the Russian Revolution, and next week we'll be talking about the interwar years as we lead up to World War II. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you guys next week.